Okay, so I'm going to show you a couple of more slides and then we're going to pause here to make sure that this is clear. And then we're going to really dive in experientially. So to give you a sense for what we can explore and how we can kind of tease apart the sense of self, we have to do a bunch of experiments, a uh, ex bunch of experiments. And the idea is we could, we brought in a bunch of folks from a bunch of different traditions so that we weren't you know, biasing things. And what we had people do was just practice getting used to meditating while they were in a scanner. So they would meditate with their eyes open, there'd be a blank screen, they wouldn't get any feedback. Then we would have them meditate and watch a graph that was just a simulated graph just so they could get used to meditating while some graph was filling in because that can be pretty distracting, especially <laughs> when we're like, oh, that's my brain. So we wanted them to kind of be able to just observe that. And then we gave them these active conditions where they would meditate, they'd watch the graph, uh, where they get feedback from their own brains, kind of like you saw with Anderson Cooper. And then finally, what we could do, what we, what we were doing in this experiment was to really see if we could characterize what is actually happening, line up people's subjective experience, you know, what is this self-reference actually lining up with experientially? So we would have them line up their, their subjective experience with the graph and tell us what happened. But as a, as a way to confirm that this was actually true, because they didn't know whether the graph should go up or whether it should go down. I, in fact, we could flip it and, you know, they, so that they wouldn't come in in a biased manner. But we said, okay, if, if it's really lining up with your experience, so for example, your experience of meditating, make the graph go blue in this case, make it go in the direction that you're lining up with meditation. Another way to look that, at that is, you know, you, you, these first two steps are helping people learn how to meditate while they're looking at their own brain. And then they've got to confirm that that is actually lining up with that their subjective experience is actually lining up with their brain activity and then verify that. Okay. If it's true, you know, make it, make it go blue, so to speak. And we, we did that. So uh, people's subjective experience lined up very well with their brain activity in terms of, we started with the simple question, which way does, when you meditate, does it line up with your experience and which way does the graph go? And then, um, so for example, you know, it was close to eight out of 10 where uh, people in two different studies, first with fMRI feedback and then with EEG neurofeedback where we could give uh, feedback from specific brain regions. And then, um, you know, they've got to verify, they got to prove that they can make it go blue, so to speak, just the color of the graph where novices couldn't do this, they couldn't make it move in the direction of meditation. Experienced meditators could do this pretty consistently. Now I wanna give you a sense for the rich data set that we can get from this uh, that really helps us zoom in even more on, on what's going on here. So here's an experienced meditator and um, we, this is a one minute run. So only one minute of meditation. And after that, we ask, you know, he's checking in with the graph as he's going, and we ask him to tell us what happened. So he said at the beginning, I caught myself. I was trying to guess when the words were going to end. If that was our baseline task and when the meditation was going to begin. So I was kind of trying to be like, okay, ready, set, go. And then there was an additional word that popped up and I was like, oh shit. And there's that red spike you see there. And then I sort of immediately settled in and I was really getting into it. And he's correlated this with it going, the graph going down is posterior cingulate activity decreasing. And then I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. It's describing exactly what I'm saying. And then you see that red spike. And I was like, okay, don't get distracted. And I got back into it and got blue again. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievable. It's doing exactly what my mind is doing. So he's laughing at this point and he said, so I find it really funny to the next question. That's a perfect map of what my mind was going through. So here we can start to take people's subjective individual experience and we can bring it all together in an unbiased way. So we can really figure out without, you know, assuming anything what's going on. And so we can use 
techniques uh, called neurophenomenology, where we can use these methods where we bring the subjective experience together with brain activity. The details aren't that important, but let me just show you what this looks like. So anytime somebody reports anything on the graph, just like that meditator did, you know, that person had three or four, four or five data points. We can have, we can code those into, you know, you can see all the different codes that we can make. And we can do this in a blinded manner where somebody doesn't even know what the hypothesis is. They don't know what brain region it is. They're just told to transcribe and bring these codes together. So start with these open codes, then they can lump these together into more central codes and then bring these even um, into more in smaller categories of theoretical codes. And once we do that, we can then line this up with brain activity from moment to moment to moment. So you can see here a lot of theoretical codes that actually line up pretty well with a lot of these concepts having to do with meditation and mindfulness and Buddhism and, and other types of meditation. So not efforting, contentment, concentration. So this is what it looks like when we line it up with the brain activity. So when we look at increased activation of the posterior cingulate cortex, we see a lot of a lot of people had distracted distraction, where you know when they were uh, distracted, like sixty four instances, they all lined up with them activating their brain, uh, their posterior cingulate. When they were interpreting their experience, they were, for example, deliberating their memories other types of things, this also activated it. There's another whole category that we called controlling. And I say a different category because this had been shown previously in the literature. When, you, when, med, when researchers had non-meditators come in and just lie in the scanner and you know, they'd give them boring tasks and they would get distracted, they showed that their, their default mode network got activated. Here, this other category came out that we just called controlling because we weren't sure exactly what it meant, but it was effort when people were efforting, when they were discontent, this also activated the posterior cingulate. In contrast to this, oh, here's an example. This person said, I worried, I wasn't using the graph as an object of meditation, so I tried to look at it harder. This is this, is this part. I tried to somehow pay attention more. In contrast, with undistracted awareness, a lot of people reporting concentration, again, a lot of meditators in this study, observing sensory experience, and then also this category of not efforting, you know, effortless doing, we called it, uh, where people were reporting that they were just, they were, they were equanimous, they were content, and this was deactivating the posterior cingulate. Here are some examples. Person said, toward the middle, I had some thoughts, which I don't see on the graph, maybe because I let them flow by. Another, I noticed the more that I relaxed and stopped trying to do anything, the bluer it went. 